And I'm just going to get confirmation that the stream is working. Okay. <clears throat> so um, we'll begin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the world watching the stream. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to this webinar, Subnational Governments in the COVID-19 Scenario in the Americas, brought to you by the Organization of American States, the Forum of Federations, and the University of Kent. On the International Day of Peace 2020, this webinar will examine and discuss perhaps the most significant challenge currently facing the Americas, the COVID-19 crisis and the post-pandemic rebuild. More specifically, it focuses on the functions and responsibilities of subnational governments in response to the crisis and their role in supporting the development of a more just, tolerant and peaceful societies in the hemisphere in the aftermath. We are very privileged to be joined by an esteemed panel of experts, academics and practitioners from Latin America, the Caribbean and Europe to discuss this crucial topic. Uh, to very briefly introduce myself, I'm Liam Whittington and I work for the Forum of Federations. Uh, the organizing partners are very excited to be able to bring this uh, discussion to you today. Uh, before we get underway, uh, a few points relating to the presentation and format of this webinar. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and following the events, the video will be posted on the YouTube channels of the forum and the OAS. So if you're not able to stay with us for the duration, the full duration, uh, there will be an opportunity to catch up later on anything that you miss. In terms of our formats today, uh, the webinar is divided into two sections. In our first section, our panelists will present national and regional experiences of the COVID crisis from Latin America and the Caribbean, the functions of subnational governments in the response efforts, and the key challenges that they face in dealing with the impact of the pandemic. We will also hear about the experiences of Uruguay and Germany, two countries which have been highlighted as dealing effectively with the first wave. Finally, We'll hear about how the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities provides a voice for subnational government within the Council of Europe. Our second section will consist of a discussion between the panelists, and we encourage you to get involved by typing any questions you have into the YouTube live chat box. We'll address as many of these as we can in the time we have available, uh, so please don't be shy and get typing. And so with that webinar housekeeping complete, I would like to invite Rupak Chattapari, President and CEO of the Forum of Federations, Magdalena Talamas, the Director of the Department for the Promotion of Peace at the OAS, and Professor Neofitas Lozides, Director of the Conflict Analysis Research Center at the University of Kent, to say a few words to open proceedings. Arupak, please, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Liam, for the introduction and for kicking off the seminar. I'm excited to be here this morning and to participate in this first ever event organized under the new partnership between the Forum of Federations, the Organization for American States, and the University of Kent. Uh, we are excited about this collaboration to support the Department for the Promotion of Peace in its mandate. And the examination of subnational governments, their resilience, the ability to carry out governance functions is very, very timely in the context of the COVID crisis. The unprecedented public health crisis brought, brought on by COVID is accompanied by massive crises around the protection of li livelihoods which threatens to undo many, many decades of progress and poverty alleviation. The economic and social fallout from COVID-19 will likely linger for many, many years and impact disproportionately upon women and other marginalized groups. With high levels of pre-existing inequality across much of the Americas, the clawing of our way back out of this morass is likely to be both time consuming and difficult. As we look back on six months of the pandemic, I think it's become increasingly clear that the blunt instruments that national governments have used in the form of national lockdowns are both 
unsustainable and undesirable. Unsustainable because it's destroyed livelihoods and the fiscal basis that allows governments to deliver critical services. And unde undesirable because of the social upheavals caused by unemployment and marginalization. I think that as much of the world enters a second wave of the COVID crisis, governments around the world are considering more nuanced responses to crisis management. And in this context, local governments will play an ever more increasingly important role. As the level of government closest to the people it serves, local authorities have a better understanding on the specific dynamics of a crisis and also potentially are better equipped to provide bespoke solutions to communities that they serve. Subnational governments are likely to play an important role in addressing the asymmetric challenges posed by the post-pandemic rebuild, contributing not just to the rebuilding of just and peaceful societies in the hemisphere, but in, in finding custom solutions uh, to very specific contexts around the world. At the Forum of Federations, we have seen the value that, that comes from learning from the experiences of other countries, and it's in that spirit that the forum partners on this initiative. In Latin America is a very, or the Americas rather, is a very diverse hemisphere. You have large countries, small countries, federations, decentralized states, uh, centralized states, but they all have in common the existence of some, some form of subnational government. And I think there is value in learning from the best practices across uh, the region, but also to learn from the experiences of, of countries outside the region as we think about how we, we support the re rebuild, both economic but also social uh, in the post COVID scenario. I expect that subnational government's contribution to crisis management will outlast the inevitable end of the pandemic. And so I'm eager to hear the national and regional insights of our panelists today. I would like to thank very much our distinguished panelists for taking the time to join us. And I would like to express my deepest gratitude to our partners and colleagues who've made this event possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rupert. Magdalena. Thank you very much, Liam, and, and good morning. I just want to very briefly provide some background and context with regard to this new partnership that we are launching today. The, the Department for the Promotion of Peace was recently created in an effort to shift um, the focus of our peace building efforts toward the preventive aspect of conflict management. Because as we all know, prevention saves lives, prevention saves costs, and prevention massively improves the quality of living of individuals and, and of communities. Uh, however, the task of peace building and, and, and conflict management is a shared responsibility. And that is why we formed the strategic alliance with the Forum of Federations and the University of Kent so that we could pull together the, the resources, the knowledge, the skills um, of a, 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 range, a diverse range of group of experts in the field of peace building and conflict management so we could add further value to our own peace building efforts. And while the pandemic um, has created yet what seems another insurmountable challenge in a hemisphere that was already plagued with very complex problems, we also believe that it provides a, a unique opportunity, an opportunity for reflection, um, to learn from those mistakes and those instances where we didn't get it right, but also to learn from those uh, best practices and success stories that, that are out there. Uh, today, as we commemorate the International Day of Peace, we are reminded that peace is an action. Uh, peace is an ongoing process. It's a daily commitment to inching our way forward uh, toward a better future. Uh, but we cannot do this alone. We must work also hand in hand with the subnational governments, just as Rupak said, um, because peace um, begins at home. It begins in our communities. It begins in those environments that are um, closest to us. And that is why we need to uh, raise the voice of subnational governments. We need to listen more carefully to what they have to say so we can get a better and clearer idea of the challenges at, at the local level. Um, and many years ago, when I was in charge of relations with the permanent observers here at the OAS, I worked closely with the permanent mission of Costa Rica and Ambassador Francisco Chacon at that time. Um, so we could develop a mechanism of high-level exchanges and dialogue between the permanent observers and the member states. 
And the result is that today we have high level exchanges between the member states and the permanent observers, but also between the member states and the and civil society, between the member states and um, the private sector. But we do not have a similar mechanism uh, for high level dialogue and exchanges between the foreign ministers um, uh, and the member states and the representatives of the national governments. But we do know that there are very good uh, coordination mechanisms um, in other parts of the world. And one such uh, very highly effective mechanism is the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe. And we are very fortunate today to have the Acting Secretary General of the Congress to talk about the work that he advances and how he promotes uh, coordination between local and central governments so that not only uh, we may be inspired by um, his presentation, but also it might even um, serve as a roadmap for our own efforts in this direction. Um, finally, I just want to thank uh, our panelists. Um, uh, we're privileged to have you with us here today from Argentina, Mexico, the EU, uh, Germany, the Caribbean. Um, I also want to thank my partners uh, at the Forum and uh, the University of Kent with whom we've been working closely to uh, make this event a uh, success. We're very much looking forward to the discussions. And of course, as uh, a Uruguayan myself, I cannot help but acknowledge the presence of um, our notable Uruguayan uh, speaker here today, uh, Dr. Alfie. Um, is a part of, uh, he, he's heading the, the dream team in Uruguay who have made invaluable contributions um, to the COVID-19 mitigation efforts in our country and we are very grateful. So thank you and thank you to all. Um, Liam, I believe it's back to you. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Uh, finally, Neo, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Liam. Uh, also from the University of Kent in my brief introduction, I would like to share my excitement and appreciation to our partners and colleagues at the Department for the Promotion of Peace of the Organization of American States and the Forum of Federations for co-organizing these timely uh, events. In the signing of the memorandum of uh, uh, joint understanding, uh, the, the three teams have put together an ambitious agenda focusing on identifying best practices in conflict prevention, constitutional and federal design, the nature and evolution of mediation, as well as gender, sustainability, and human rights. At CARC, uh, the Conflict Analysis Research Center at the University of Kent, we're pleased that our first joint event is taking place uh, on the International Day of Peace. And the UN Assembly has declared the 21st of September as a day devoted to strengthening the ideas of peace through observing 24 hours of nonviolence and ceasefire, and also an opportunity for us to reflect on best practices on mediation and conflict prevention. Uh, in the conflict, in the context of the ongoing uh, COVID-19 emergency, the study of the pandemic's impact, governance, as well as uh, a capacity of states and society to, talk, to tackle intra and inter-ethnic state conflict is timely and likely to continue uh, in the decades uh, ahead. As Richard has uh, argued in a very well-cited um, uh, article, the president of the Council of Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, uh, back in April, uh, the pandemic is more likely to accelerate history rather than reshape it. Uh, his argument is that it's going to reinforce existing tendencies rather than being a turning point in, in history. Uh, although this argument uh, has made, in his argument, in his article, he makes no mention of uh, Latin and Central America, which is a very interesting question by itself, why he focuses on the traditional uh, questions of American foreign policy, the Middle East, uh, containment of China, uh, Western Europe, and so on. This argument has direct implications uh, for, for, for the region. Uh, the region's uh, uh, increasing uh, chronic uh, inequalities, environmental challenges, and marginalized communities make it an area uh, of um, uh, prime interest in the uh, pandemic uh, uh, emergency. Uh, at the same time, this macro argument ignores what federal and subnational uh, authorities uh, could, could do and how they can reinforce or prevent uh, some of the macro scale challenges that uh, countries are facing according to the Haas uh, argument. So in identifying this gap, we organized together a very interesting uh, line of speakers and conference today, looking at the international experience in the COVID pandemic and how variation in local and subnational governance can help us understand uh, best practices as a first essential step uh, in dealing with the crisis. 
At the University of Kent, we would also like to thank our distinguished uh, panelists for joining us, as well as our colleagues who worked tirelessly in the past few weeks to make this event possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neo. And, and thanks to all, uh, Rupak, Magdala, and Neo, for that, uh, providing that very effective framing uh, for our subsequent discussion. Uh, and so without further ado, um, we'll get going with our first session. And to guide us through the next couple of hours, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator today, Ana Maria Lobos. Ana is an assistant lecturer and PhD candidate in comparative politics at the University of Kent, where she teaches courses in political research and analysis, comparative politics and sociology. Anna conducted research on health economics in Latin America at the University of Miami, and her current work focuses on the impact of political legitimacy on public attitudes towards punishment in South America. Anna, thank you very much for joining us. Um, my work is done, so please take it away. Thank you for that, uh, Liam. It really is a pleasure to be here today. Um, being Chilean myself, and as you mentioned, uh, with a research interest in political legitimacy, it's a privilege to be able to hear directly from our panelists about the different um, country and regional difference uh, uh, experiences, as well as best practices in response to COVID-19. Um, so that said, I would like to go ahead and introduce our first presenter today, uh, Dr. Matias Bianchi. Uh, Dr. Bianchi is a founder and uh, director of Asuntos del Sur, a think tank focused on political innovation in Latin America. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Arizona. Dr. Bianchi holds a PhD in political science from the Institut d'Etudes Politiques de Paris, Sciences Po. He has published articles in academic journals and books with specific focus on subnational politics and democratic governance. He's currently leading a research project on collaborative governance in six Latin American countries. So please, uh, without further ado, Dr. Bianchi. I need to unmute first. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. I, I would like to, to thank the Organization of American State, the University of Kent and the Foreign Federations for putting together this important conversation on subnational governments. I'm, I really feel honored to be part of in this exchange of ideas. I look forward for the next couple of hours of learning from my, for my colleagues. Um, I only have 10 minutes, so I want to make four brief points. The first one is that, to me, one of the most important lessons we've learned uh, is that it's not enough to get grip of this crisis on our own country, state, or community. So the COVID pandemic is showing us the, the need for, to strengthen collaborative governance regimes across the region and across the world. And one of these kind of regimes is federalism. Um, this, this, is a global, this is a global challenge, as, as we all know, and we need to learn to work together. That something is, is not, uh, is less common than, than we think. We need to collaborate in the use of our resources, to share our medical goods, to share best practices and, and knowledge, to coordinate healthcare policies, security protocols, solutions, so on and so forth. These practices have shown in many countries to be crucial to slow down the disease and eventually to contain it. Federalism, that is something that I, I worked several times, I been, have the, the pressure to, to work with the Foreign Federation, is actually a political doctrine founded on those values. It seeks unity among diversity, aiming at cooperation, solidarity among its parts. Therefore, more than ever, do we need these kind of institutional arrangements to, that could provide us the, the political infrastructure to develop these common, these common solutions. Of course, as we know, these values not always translate, translate into practice and fairness and other uh, collective governance regimes ultimately depends on what we do with them, but they are crucial. Uh, my second point is uh, I, I like to reflect specifically in the case of, of Argentina that I was requested to do. Um, Argentina had a fairly positive uh, reaction. It was very quick and very strong from the very beginning. It imposed a strict quarantine. 
uh, it imposed, uh, it, it invested uh, resources in the construction and the decentralization of capabilities to uh, produce ventilators, to <clears throat> uh, test the, 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 the COVID patients, uh, to build in, the, in two months, it built two new hospitals more than any other government in, in probably decades. Uh, and also spend, it had one of the strongest fiscal spending in the world as a share of the GDP as a this rapid response. The most important one was a, a support for 9 million people. This is around 20% of the total population with, with a, a monthly stipend of 10,000 pesos. That is roughly $150, $50. Uh, and also assisting over 350,000 uh, uh, private enterprises to pay the, the, the income of their employees. The, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the first results were pretty good. In the government managed to flatten the curve for four months. It was taken as one of the poster child of the of the responses to to COVID for the first months, it still has one of the lowest fat, uh, fatality rates in in the region, only above Paraguay and Venezuela, um, and never crossed the sixty percent of the UCI um, beds, the, emerg the 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 bed for for emergency. The capacity never crossed over sixty percent. Um, but well, the, the economy has fallen, has had a, a strong impact on, is, is expected to have a minus 10% uh, decrease of the, of the GDP. Um, the economic situation before the, the, the pandemic was already uh, pretty harsh. And the other positive element is that the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires was the last uh, of the largest ones to be compromised during this, this pandemic. And one of the secrets for this early good response, good results, is that the government uh, lean strongly in the coordination of the different levels of government. The government sat on the table, the provincial governments and also the, the, local, the local governments and use its federal institutions to be part of this, seeking for vertical and horizontal collaboration to respond to this, these policies. And it was very promising. There was, just to give you a, a couple of examples, only one province produced ventilators in the, in the country. It made an arrangement with the private company to, have, to supply all the, the, the rest of the provinces depending on their needs that, that the government was going to provide. There was only center lab to test for uh, COVID uh, patients. And it Im Im implemented the decentralization pro uh, process to do it in over 15 other provinces in a period of less than, than two months. It created a unit for coordination of policies between the, the federal government the city of Buenos Aires and the province of Buenos Aires to coordinate infrastructure, facilities, uh, and measures. Uh, quality important measures regarding quarantine, opening of businesses, parks, so on, and, and so forth. Um, so that was the, the positive side. The reality is in the last two months, cases have been skyrocketing. And, um, and now, now Argentina is among the top top ten, I think, in in the in the number, the global numbers. Casualties are for uh, um, are still uh, low compared to to other countries, but the the number of infected is is very high. the The reason is is again the the nature of our uh, territorial development. The, the uneven development of our country that also needs the collaborative responses. 40% of the population, 60% of our GDP is concentrated on a small portion of our territory 
that is the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires. So wealth, investment, infrastructure, everything is concentrated there. But also poverty, exclusion, informality, and insecurity. And this creates these dynamics that created, that made that over, for a long period of, of, of several months, o over 90% of new infected cases were based in these metropolitan areas. The reason is that you have um, 1,400 informal settlements and 10% of the population in Greater Buenos Aires lack of sewers. So Argentina needs to find a solution for the long run to deal with this unevil development of, of the country. Um, so the, why things have, have changed and now the new cases are 50% are of new cases are in interior provinces that are smaller, but now the, 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 the hot spot for diseases is concentrated there. And the reason I find is, is the lack of institutionalization of these collaborative governance regimes. That with the, the political fatigue that this normally has and is having in, in every country after six months of this hardship and the economic hardship that the society is suffering, the political stamina of the government trying to, to create this, this uh, collaborative uh, regimes has loosened. And, and that's where this is the, the agenda that I think we need to work on. The good thing is that we've seen in, 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 in Argentina and other countries in the region is that that kind of regimes, they do work and they do produce uh, good outcomes. We've seen how horizontal coordination of sharing infrastructure, health workers in different, uh, among the local governments around the region have provided excellent, excellent solutions to combat this, this regime. And there are institutional devices that are helping for this, this collaboration. In the case of Argentina, it's been very useful the case of the Federal Council for Healthcare, that is a, a, an institution created in the 1980s to provide this, this, collabor this collaboration and has provided important solutions during the, this pandemic. But we need to learn that these this Federal Councils in, in, in Argentina are uneven, the lack of institutionalization, the lack of a strong regulation, the lack of financial autonomy. So that is a, something that we need to continue to work. And as, as it was mentioned in, when I was introduced, we are working in six different countries in, in Latin America, trying to learn about these governance models that are helping to provide these, these solutions. We are convinced that addressing these policy challenges will not only help us to respond to COVID, but also will provide us with a roadmap for building new models of governance around the region. And it's gonna help us to respond to the most pressing challenges that we face. Most of the policy challenges that we face in Latin America have the same dynamics. They're global, they include North-South relationship, they impact the poorest. Uh, so all of these challenges, and I'm gonna put a name on that, is migration, is uh, extractive industries, is climate change. Most of our pressing challenges have the same dynamic. So it is very important that we address these, these questions and we learn how to collaborate among the different levels of governments. I'm gonna stop here for now. Um, I can come back to, to other points later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bianchi. We'll definitely come back to that during the discussion. Um, I would like to uh, move ahead and introduce our second panelist today, uh, Dr. Juan Cruz Olmeda. So Dr. Olmeda is an associate professor at El Colegio de México in Mexico City. 
He holds a master's and a PhD in political science from Northwestern University in the US. He also holds a master's in ethics, politics, and public policy from the University of Essex in the UK. His research agenda is focused on issues related to subnational politics and comparative federalism in Latin America. He's also been the editor in chief of the academic journal Foro Internacional since 2017. So, uh, Dr. Olmeda, please. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I am very pleased to be here and share uh, this panel with, with, with you. And I hope to learn a lot uh, from other uh, experiences. I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about Mexico. Uh, as, as you know, Mexico is a, is a federal country with uh, 32 states. And uh, it's um, even if it's a federal country, it's still very centralized. So I think it's important to have that in mind to understand the response to the crisis. Uh, first, I, I want to um, share with you some basic data about the effects uh, of the pandemic uh, in the country. Uh, Mexico has uh, nowadays uh, more or less 80,000 deaths and 800,000 cases uh, that uh, the number of death uh, per million it's uh, more or less uh, similar to the ones uh, observed in the US and Brazil but if we consider uh, the uh, case uh, fatality rate is uh, much higher than in the US and Brazil um, hopefully the number of cases uh, new cases and, and new deaths uh, are declining uh, as uh, the Undersecretary of Health uh, announced uh, yesterday. So uh, maybe this trend uh, it's uh, changing, but uh, the, 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 the bad thing is that uh, winter is coming. So uh, the situation or, or the second wave uh, will be ahead. Um, the second point is that uh, the pandemic uh, has also a very important negative effect, uh, effect in, in terms of the economy. Uh, the GDP dropped uh, 17% in the second quarter of 2020, and this decline is uh, worse than uh, the decline observed in the two previous economic crises in the country in 2009 and uh, uh, 1994. So the situation is, is, is complicated, and uh, as, as uh, you probably know, uh, Mexico is, is a very unequal country and uh, inequalities uh, probably will, um, will increase uh, in, in, the, in the following uh, years. Uh, according to, the, to, to the, the governmental body in charge of uh, measuring poverty, we expect to have two, uh, sorry, uh, 10 million uh, new poors uh, in, in the in the in the next uh, year. So let me move uh, to to give you some general idea about the the, the response that the country um, that the, the country uh, gave to to the crisis. Um, one important point to mention is that according to the constitution. Uh, when some this this kind of emergencies um, uh, emerge, uh, a, a, a particular body should be called uh, in order to uh, give the, the measures that the country should uh, follow. And this is the National Public Health uh, Council that convened uh, at the end of March and uh, is uh, was the body uh, in charge of. Uh, in a sense, um, designing the, the general strategy to, to deal with the, with the pandemic. And as a result of that, uh, we had uh, this national campaign of healthy distancing that was uh, declared uh, in March 23rd. And as a result of that, uh, education activities were suspended, uh, some recommendations about how to deal with uh, vulnerable employees uh, were also issues uh, issued and um, mainly, I mean, the general uh, idea was that uh, the population should stay at home. Um, uh, one important point is that since the beginning, uh, the, the, I think the general dilemma was how to stop 
contagion without affecting the, the economy so much. So uh, the federal government adopted a specific measure to strengthen the health system, to control the disease, for example, reconverting public hospitals, uh, expanding the public uh, network with the inclusion of uh, private hospitals, and importing the essential equipment required to uh, care for patients uh, more effectively. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, as I said, economy was a very important concern due mainly to the important size of the informal economy. So, for example, 60 percent of people uh, work in the informal economy. So for the government it was very important to uh, care for, for that for that sector. Uh, and then, for example, no mandatory mobility restrictions were formally imposed across the country, mainly because uh, people working in the informal economy, uh, in a sense, um, live uh, day by day, uh, earning uh, income uh, on a daily on a daily basis. Um, and so uh, I think uh, it's important to mention that even though uh, Mexico, as I said, is, is very centralized uh, in fiscal uh, terms, particularly, uh, the state governments were very active uh, in, in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, and since the beginning, uh, it was clear that in a sense, state governments uh, began to compete in a sense with the federal government. Uh, for, so for example, uh, many state governments uh, considered that the federal authority was not acting fast enough. And so they decided to adopt their own measures uh, and then, for example, apart from canceling classes, uh, 10 out of the 32 states closed bars, restaurants, museums, and beaches earlier than the date proposed by federal authorities. And in addition to that, all state uh, governments adopted measures restricting work and movement, um, most of them implemented food support plans. Uh, and also the economic relief uh, programs uh, devised by state governments were very important and range from uh, wage uh, subsidies and cash transfers to uh, de deferral and discount on taxes for both individual and businesses. Uh, in addition, uh, tax I I inspections were, were postponed in uh, many states. Um, but I think the most important lesson uh, from the Mexican case uh, is the lack of coordination between level, uh, levels of, of government. And this was due both to the lack of uh, institutional um, bodies um, able to, uh, in a sense, um, put these two uh, type of authorities uh, together and also to political polarization. Um, so uh, the, the lack of coordination was clear since the beginning, but uh, with time uh, slowly evolved into an open political conflict between uh, federal authorities and several government, uh, governors uh, uh, enrolled in parties in opposition to the president. and. Uh, this, uh, for example, led to uh, some strange situations. Uh, for example, uh, in July, nine governors signed an open letter asking for the resignation of the under, uh, for the resignation of the Under Secretary of Health, uh, who is the person in charge of the federal government strategies uh, strategy to, to deal with the with the crisis. And uh, also some governors accused the federal government to uh, manipulate some uh, data in order to, uh, in a sense, uh, punish uh, them uh, in political terms. Uh, so I think this is the, considering the, 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 the possibility that uh, the, the second wave will hit the country very soon, I think it's important to uh, understand uh, the reasons behind this lack of coordination and to, uh, in a sense, uh, work on this uh, to, to uh, design a broader and more effective response. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lamea. I appreciate that. Um, so moving on to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Joy St. John. So Dr. St. John, uh, John is the Executive Director of CARFA, the Caribbean Public Health Agency since July to, uh, 2019, uh, where she has led the public health response in the CARICOM region. Dr. St. John was also an Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization from October 2017 to April 2019, uh, with direct responsibility for climate and other determinants of health. She was also the first Barbadian to hold the post of Assistant Director General. And she was also the first Caribbean person to perform the role of Chairman of the Executive Board of the WHO from 2012 to 2013. Dr. St. John is also former Chief Medical Officer of Barbados, the top public health advisor to the Minister of Health, responsible for the oversight of the management of the health sector. So without further ado, please, Dr. St. John. Thank you very much. I consider it a privilege to speak about how the Caribbean has been responding to this crisis and be part of a panel of such accomplished professionals. I will give you a historical background to set the context of my presentation. The foundation for the CARICOM response began in 1986 with the elaboration of the first iteration of the Caribbean Cooperation in Health in 1984, the CARICOM Conference of Ministers Responsible for Health accepted the need for a mechanism for health development through increasing collaboration and promoting technical cooperation among countries in the Caribbean. Now in its fourth iteration, CCH has fostered an efficacious level of functional cooperation in the CARICOM region. The next major foundation milestone would be the creation of the Caribbean Public Health CARFA, agency CARFA, which I now lead, in 2011 from five regional health institutions, which was operationalized as a CARICOM institution in 2013, with an intergovernmental agreement which has a clearly defined public health mandate. The next major foundation was the creation of the heads of government approved Regional Cooperation Mechanism for Ebola in 2014, later renamed the Regional Coordination Mechanism for Health Security, which provides a mechanism for coordination of regional action whenever there is a threat to health security. Serendipitously, the previous Executive Director of CARFA, Dr. James Hospitalis, spearheaded international development assistance to achieve health system strengthening for health security through the Agence Française de Développement, EU, and the World Bank, which has allowed focused funded foundation support to be ready almost instantaneously when the COVID-19 pandemic was declared. Fast forward to November 2019, when the security cluster of CARICOM decided on the keystone for the ring fence of the foundation, which had been started building in 1986 by raising epidemics to a higher level in the tiers of threats and risks. So on January 4th, 2020, CARFA alerted the chief medical officers of the region about our concerns regarding this novel virus in China. By the end of January, the security cluster was activated to monitor persons traveling into the region from countries of interest while CARFA activated its incident management team. To respond to COVID-19, CARFA employs a strategy of collaboration with key regional and international partners and experts for coordination through meetings of the Regional Coordination Mechanism for Health Security. Member states and sister public health agencies including PHE, APS, RIVM, CDC, and PHAC, and PAHO come together to determine action. The Caribbean Disaster and Emergency Management Agency, SEDEMA, links CARFA and PAHO to the disaster preparedness arm of the security cluster to complete the ring fencing of the CARICOM region 
by the public health, disaster preparedness, and security arms of the security cluster of CARICOM. But is it enough? Around the world, people are ill and too many are dying. Globally, economies are suffering, not least of which are the economies of the largely tourism dependent CARICOM states. The people of CARICOM are our greatest resource. Therefore, CARFA aim to prevent avoidable illness and death. Like NCDs, CARICOM will not be able to treat its way out of COVID-19, partly because the risk factors for severe COVID-19, the NCDs, are so prevalent. CARFA has supported the member states through diagnostic testing, protocols, guidelines, and checklists for health and a wide range of sectors, especially the revenue generating sectors. For example, we are working on the safe return to tourism and for activities like national general elections and the premier sporting activity, cricket. CARFA initially provided testing to support to 17 of its 26 member states until they received capacity and with the support of the air wing of the regional security system, continue to provide support to member states when commercial flights halted. To date, our lab has tested over 22,000 samples and remains ready to support as required. But a pandemic this complex must be managed in a collaborative, coordinated and calculated manner. The most effective collaboration has been the technical interplay between the chief medical officers, the political collaboration of the ministers of health, and the whole of CARICOM regional leadership of the CARICOM heads, with the two latter facilitated through the CARICOM secretariat's convening power. The CARICOM heads of government at this time have exercised tremendous leadership in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Individually, the heads engaged their communities from the man in the street to the national level, pulling government sectors, the unions and the private sector together to the forefront of the response. At the regional level, the Conference of Heads, led by then Chair the Honorable Mia Motley of Barbados and now the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, have mandated a common approach for the CARICOM states and mandated the elaboration of a common public health protocol for the region. The Heads have signaled the imperative of coordination in procurement and distribution of COVID supplies and most recently have approved the requirements for our CARICOM travel bubble. The CARICOM heads of government did not forget the community leaders and civil society organizations as part of the strategy to involve citizens and give them a voice at the decision-making table. And the public has responded accordingly. I well remember the issue of mass for the general public. In the Caribbean, I witnessed what I call a human experiment. Masks were judged to be useful, then a fashion statement. I will always see this CARICOM compliance with mask wearing as an outcome of the head's focus on community involvement and the ownership taken by the CARICOM citizens. This pandemic, pandemic has been described as a marathon being run at sprint speed. CARICOM has responded to move swiftly to save lives while preserving the best of our cultural and societal peculiarities in order to maintain life and livelihoods. We used this opportunity to show the rest of the world that despite our small size and under-resourced healthcare systems, we have the ability to survive unrelenting adversity. To contain disease spread in the region, Actions which were guided by the evidence presented have been the norm. CARFA continues to advocate for the relevant authorities at the national level to follow the science. I thank OAS for this opportunity to spread the CARICOM message of whole of society and whole of region coordination for responding to crises. The decisions taken by our leaders have all been done to safeguard lives, manage risk while continuing to coexist safely with COVID-19. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. St. John. I appreciate that as well. Um, I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Mr. Isaac Alfie. Mr. Alfie is a Uruguayan economist, accountant, and politician. In March of this year, uh, he was appointed as director of the Planning and Budget Office by President Luis Alberto Lacalle Pou. In April of 2020, he was further tasked with leading the president's technical advisory group to manage the COVID-19 crisis. He served as Senator of the Colorado Party between 2005 and 2010 and as Minister of Economy from 2003 to 2005. Mr. Ophia was also a regular contributing columnist for various news media, including the El País newspaper and the weekly journal Voices. He teaches economics, finance, statistics, and math at the University of the Republic, the Montevideo University, and Catholic University. Mr. Afi has received numerous distinctions throughout his career, including the Best Finance Minister of the Americas Award in 2004, the Personalité de l'Avenir Award from the Government of France, and the Citibank Prize Scholarship from Columbia University. Uh, so welcome, Mr. Afi. Uh, please, go ahead. Thanks a lot. Good morning. Um, thanks to OAS. The Forum for the Nation at Kent University uh, for the invitation. It's an honor, an honor for me uh, and for us, for, our, for my country, to be here today and to share our experience. Uh, I have a, a, a little uh, presentation. Maybe I, I can share. I can share it. O only to to be more organized. Me. Not here. Uh, as you know, Uruguay uh, it's a small country by South American standard, only by South American standard, of course. Uh, we have only 3.5 million people. Uh, uh, as the, the same case of Argentina, uh, our population is highly urbanized and uh, therefore dense in its capital, Montevideo, and the metropolitan area, which concentrate about 50% of the total population. Montevideo, but Montevideo only represents the 0.9% of the total territory, so half of the country has a very low population density. And this re reality was very important. Uh, let me let me share this. Okay. This reality was very important uh, when we traced our roadmap. Um, I, After the new administration took office in March, March the 1st, Uruguay was uh, abruptly confronted with the coronavirus shock. Uh, the shock, uh, the effect of the pandemic on the economic has have been, in some respect, similar across all the countries in the world, yet in other respects, they have been very different. At the beginning of the, of the shock, we, we faced we need to face a, a, a resolution. We, we need to do some uh, resolution. And in, in, our, in our thought, uh, when, when we took the, a measure, when we take a measure, uh, you must be able to sustain it. And it's impossible for, in our opinion, uh, to from the people perspective and from the fiscal and public finance perspective to keep the economy in a total quarantine for a long, a long term. So we thought that we, uh, we weren't able we, to, to, to maintain a, a, a total lockdown and we tried to make a soft quarantine, quarantine during the during the, 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 the tough times. Our plan uh, 
how uh, a, mixed, a mixed strategy okay, and some uh, difference with, with, with other, uh, with other uh, countries. We have some similarities, of course, uh, synchronized with all the rest of the world uh, on the supply risk and the financial risk, and the, the vaccine effects on the activities where individuals per perceive a high risk of contagion associated with consumption and there are close substitute variables. Um, in the first uh, time span of the three weeks, the last two weeks of March, approximately, and the first week of April, our economic activity largely collapsed in the, uh, as in the most country in the world. Of course, we suffer the supply risk, shortage, higher cost of, of coordination, as well financial risk uh, of the collapse of our fi uh, financial payment, system payments. Uh, but we have some difference. This is the, the similarities with, with the rest of the world. This is uh, Australia, Denmark, France, uh, Great, uh, Great Britain, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, and Europe, uh, US and Uruguay. As you see, more or less the pattern is more or less the same. The difference you, you, can, you can find at the end of, of the period uh, right now. This is the, the behavior of Uruguay uh, with uh, some neighbors or, or some Latin American countries, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Paraguay, and, and, and us. Some difference. The structure of our economy and the, the strategy to address the, the, the pandemic. Uh, many countries uh, impose uh, a prolonged uh, quarantine. Others act uh, nothing different than the seasonal flu was happening. And those uh, that introduce a, a, a mixed strategy like Uruguay. In our, the difference of our uh, structure of the economy, uh, agriculture uh, in Uruguay uh, is leading the production and its technical characteristics have almost zero contagion, con uh, contagion, contagion sorry, the risk association, associated. From that side, the damage uh, to this springboard of the Uruguay economy uh, was almost nil. This is an index of the Oxford University about the uh, stringency index. And maybe you, you can see that Uruguay has the lowest stringency index, uh, not only uh, with these selected countries, but also in Latin America. In Latin America, the stringent <laughs> index is far the, the, the fewer, not, not, not the same as the world. And you can see uh, an increase in the stringency index because it includes some uh, economic uh, transfers, monetary transfer to some uh, uh, groups of people that we, uh, uh, keep out at the be at the beginning of, of, of July because the the, re the recovery in the economy was uh, uh, stronger than we anticipate. The pillars of our mixed strategy. We have three pillars: the health, in the health sector, in the economy sector, and the timing. On the health side. Uh, we maintain restriction on, uh, on sector where, where the technical characteristics of activity make the risk of contagion very high. 
for example, entertainment restaurants at the beginning. Uh, we, we perform an, 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 an information campaign since the beginning to the importance of preserving the distance, use the mask uh, instead of OMS recommendation, and basic uh, hygiene of hands and face. We, we increase expo exponentially the testing and tracing capacity and at the same time, augmenting emergency care capacity to confront a possible peak of contagion. In fact, we develop, we develop uh, our own uh, test uh, produce uh, capacity, our own test capacity to produce the, the kit to perform the test. At the beginning was at the Institute Pasteur Fontevideo, but the private sector also developed its own capacity very, very fast. At the time, new labs uh, were able to perform the test around the country and develop the genome. So we were able to identify the virus, the virus strain and its origin very fast in order to know if there is a new strain or there is the same strain with some mutation uh, in order to uh, have the capacity to trace better the cases. This is very, very important uh, for us. So, at the end, uh, we rely the responsibility on the population at a large to take care of themselves and the others. Around 20, 25 of April, we appoint a high level expert scientist group to advise the government to continue uh, to, continue to develop uh, this strategy. And this expert uh, will have. Uh, by, uh, a bi biologist, uh, science, uh, math scientist, etc. And of course, they have a group below, below, below this. Each one uh, is the with quotation CEOs of a, a big group. And in fact, we have more than uh, 50 uh, people working to the government free work to the world, to the government in order to contain the, the pandemic. This is was this was very, very important for us, really. Uh, we, uh, we drew a map road at the, at the beginning. In fact, on 21st of, of March, we were, uh, we already had a, a road map uh, uh, that 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 um, show, shows that how to open, reopen the activities. For example, the first one activity will, will be reopened uh, was uh, sorry is at, at that time the construction. After that, rural schools, and after that, some uh, open uh, air open uh, activities. On the economic side, uh, we ensuring the, uh, the functioning of the payment system, ensuring the supply chain of food, medicine, and healthcare product, product ensure the, the normal uh, external trade, oil supply, and transportation. Uh, we introduce some temporary uh, flexibility on uh, credit risk regulation, expanding the standard unemployment insurance, and massive expand, uh, expansion of transfers to the pool. Some measures were took here, there, and in fact, uh, we plan to, our, our projections uh, show that we are going to expand around 1.6% of GDP uh, 
in transfers and uh, ex uh, expenses uh, to, to face the pandemic. There is a, a no big uh, number in international terms, maybe, uh, but for us it's enough. It, it, it's enough, at least uh, when, we, when we compare with, uh, with the results. In the time, uh, using a stimulus measure only when there is a value associated with the extra expenditure, and we are opening gradually activities once we were set the, that uh, safety protocols were in place. Right now, we have a lot of protocols uh, in many, many activities. Uh, one thing that uh, took the attention of the international society uh, that was that we are open at the, the, the schools. We are open very fast the schools. Uh, of course, uh, the, the schools are, are now working with some restrictions, some restrictions, and this restriction uh, were released, uh, start uh, released step by step. But right now it isn't uh, as normal as before the, the, the pandemic. The point was, the point is that uh, the study shows that the children are not very contagious, they are not very infectious, and almost they, uh, they haven't any risk of life. At the same time, the government uh, performed a transparency policy since the beginning, and it, uh, as, it's, as it is our traditional behavior, along our history in order to uh, release the most accurate and timely information to the population. The results. We expecting a fall in GDP about around 3.5% uh, uh, this, this year, the average of the year. In the second quarter, the the decrease in the GDP was 10.5% uh, when you compare quarter and quarter. The tax revenue collection uh, is uh, slightly high, uh, highly above like, uh, 2019. You use some temporary taxes, especially on the, on the congressman, uh, politician, and uh, higher salaries of, in the public sector, but we are, uh, we are know that the uphill, the uphill battle continue because the weakness of the regional and global uh, concert. In fact, we expect that the, the, that the activity will remain below the la last year, at least to the first quarter of next year. This is a chart that shows the performance on Uruguay uh, with other countries. This is moving average 14 days. This 14 days is the time that the, uh, the illness start and, uh, and finish. And this is, this is the same uh, chart compared with uh, Latin America. This is a, a, an error in the, in, the, in the title because it, it, it is in France and uh, US here. So the, the, the chart shows that Uruguay controlled the pandemic since the beginning and there is a, a, a line that we, we, we have around 60 cases per million of the inhabitant in 14 days COVID average. Only 60 cases in the COVID average 14 days. Of course, much less than other countries. Some economic indicators, the fuel demand uh, 
is almost the same of last year, uh, right now, more or less the same. And for example, the, the unemployment insurance that uh, high rocks at the beginning uh, of the crisis in, in March, April, and May start to uh, decrease uh, rapidly. And we, we introduced a new partial unemployment insurance that the people were able to, to, to work half time and the government pay the other half time uh, to, to, to a people. This is the, the projection of the World Bank uh, uh, about the, the real GDP, the decrease in this year, more or less the same figure of Uruguay. Uruguay, uh, our, we uh, project around 3.5% of decrease of the GDP, the World Bank project 3.7%, and an increase around 4% next year. Well, to conclude, the, the economy uh, is on the way to recovery. Even so, it is uh, visible that the COVID-19 shock has also had deep effect on the way of the world. The way of organization has been transforming and posing a challenge to the design of the social safety net. In fact, uh, we, we think that uh, vast areas of the economy are having profound changes, and, uh, and these changes are there to stay. To, to, to close this, uh, to close this, I think that we need, we also need to learn the, uh, the case of uh, Sweden, because they, they perform a totally different strategy, and right now they don't have the second wave of, of, the, of the illness. Maybe they had a right in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of the uh, strategy uh, to to have a, a, herd, a herd immunity of the population, and as the minister of, of health of Sweden said, they made or they made a, a, a big error in order to not separate. The, the people are about 65 years old, the, the, the most risky population. But maybe this, this was the, the only one error of the Sweden strategy. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your wise experiences with us, uh, Mr. Alfia. So to hear now a little about um, Germany, we have next up Professor Natalie Benke. Uh, professor Benke is a full professor and head of the working group Public Administration Public Policy at the Institute of Political Science of the Technical University Darmstadt. Her research is located at the intersection of public administration, comparative federalism, and multi-level governance. In research projects, she's investigated the role of senior civil servants in daily processes of negotiation and coordination between federal units, policies of accommodation in divided societies, the reform of fiscal federalism in Germany, dynamics of federal constitutional reforms, and the function of ethics measures in politics and administration. So please, um, Professor Benke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? This is okay, okay. So um, I'm pleased to be given the opportunity by the organizers of this webinar to share some thoughts with you on whether and if so why Germany can be regarded as a role model in the COVID-19 pandemic crisis management. My contribution is based on the assumption that the high policy implementation autonomy of Germany's sub-state units, the so-called lender, is an essential factor in explaining this success story. Still, before I begin to talk 
to you about how German federalism is organized in everyday policy making and policy implementation and how those structures and mechanisms worked in the crisis situation of pandemic man management, let me state two caveats. The first caveat addresses the assumption that Germany performed unusually well during the crisis. I happily admit that during the first wave, say between March and July 2020, we experienced no breakdown of our health system. The steep increase of daily new infections was curbed within four weeks. And most notably, we have an unusually low number of fatalities per capita. Still, as we all know, the crisis is not over. We currently observe a renewed increase of daily new infections, many speak of the second wave, and we still have to stand the test how we will contain the spread of the virus under conditions of cold weather, regular work, school and everyday social life. So let's keep fingers crossed, but not be overly enthusiastic. The second caveat addresses the assumption that German federalism and more specifically the autonomy of the lender was essential in successfully fighting the pandemic. Empirically, we only have a co-occurrence. Germany is a federal country and Germany fared comparatively well in crisis management. I will supply you with several plausible considerations why this co-occurrence might indeed be causally related. But we have no chance to test this empirically as we do not know how Germany would have fared without its federal structure. In the next couple of minutes, I will first give you a short insight into how everyday policymaking is coordinated in Germany between the federal level and the lender. I go on to describe how those, how those structures and processes which are ingrained in the German federal culture worked during the crisis. And I will conclude by sharing with you some ideas why this coordinated system of decision-making and implementation might indeed be better equipped to manage a pandemic crisis than a centralist system. Among comparative federalism scholars, Germany is typically regarded as an ideal typical case of cooperative federalism. As a matter of fact, for decades, if not centuries, our institutional setup and tradition of cooperative culture encourage intense coordination between levels and units of government, generally the vertical relationship between the federal government and the lender governments is perceived as constructive. Federal encroachment is mostly not a pressing issue. The division of labor between levels of government is marked by a functional division of powers. Legislation occurs predominantly at federal level. There, the Bundesrat, the second lender chamber, has a strong position. In matters of direct concern to the lender, federal bills require a positive majority of Bundesrat votes. Thus, the lender can strongly influence federal legislation and requests, if necessary, for example, federal co-financing in the implementation of laws. On the other hand, the lender are mainly re responsible for implementing laws. In practice, they often delegate this task to the local authorities. Healthcare, uh, specifically, is mainly in the jurisdiction of the lender. Public health offices are organized at district level and financially and personally dependent on local governments. The lender coordinate their interests in legislation and their practice and implementation in voluntary horizontal intergovernmental councils. The heads of government meet in the minister president's conference. Furthermore, sectoral policies are organized in 18 sectoral councils, among which, for example, the health minister's conference. Those councils serve to informally coordinate agenda setting as well as policy making processes horizontally, but also vertically. That means the federal representatives are mostly invited or included in those council meetings. Those meetings, as well as informal contacts between lender governments, are the most important and powerful instruments of policy coordination. During the pandemic crisis, the minister president's conference met on a much tighter time frame than usually. Usually it meets four times a year, among which twice with the chancellor, since March, they met in a rough two to three weeks rhythm as video conference where the next steps were negotiated among the lender heads of governments and the chancellor. Those video conferences served to tightly coordinate lender actions 
in accordance with the new information they received concurrently from experts, e.g. the Robert Koch Institute or medical experts uh, um, counseling the chancellor. This way, individual steps by uh, lender governments were extremely rare. As an analysis of executive orders that I conducted in the past weeks reveals. In addition to this um, coordination with intergovernmental councils, task forces within lender governments, mostly in government chancelleries, coordinate policy implementation in really every direction with ministries, lender offices, public, the press, and also with other lender and the federal level. Finally, the public health offices played an elevated role in crisis management. Being under the authority of districts, they act in a highly decentralized manner, and this decentralized action was attributed by many to the quick reaction to the crisis, e.g. in terms of providing protective gear and a testing and tracing contacts. What we could observe during, during crisis management was this a highly decentralized action in the individual lender, but simultaneously most intense coordination among all actors involved. And I believe this is indeed the best way to react in a crisis situation, which is marked by high complexity and uncertainty. Literature and crisis management stresses the importance of retrieving a maximum of information available to include expert knowledge and to act in a piecemeal manner so as to minimize the damage caused by errors. When 17 heads of government and their staff continuously exchange information, discuss and negotiate the best steps to be taken, this increases the rationality of decision-making. If we compare the, this kind of German decision-making with the, with the US, for example, we clearly see that a federal government that encroaches into decision-making of its sub-state units can do great damage to the crisis management. It is important to cooperate and to listen to each other instead of working against each other and trying to impose centralized measures. What is more, if coordinated decision-making is paired with decentralized action, it is possible to experiment with minor variation on regulations and observe which work better or worse. Finally, decentralized implementation allows lender governments to adapt their measures to regional variation and problem pressure and administrative capacities. Those few considerations highlight the advantage of a federal architecture which combines coordinated decision with decentralized action. One might argue that decentralized action in infection prevention is possible also in a system with a decentralized administration without having necessarily political federalism. Still, it is in particular the political negotiations among many autonomous governments, which, although it may take longer to arrive at a decision, contribute to taking ultimately more efficient and rational decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Benke. And moving to our last panelist, uh, we now have uh, Mr. Andreas Kiefer. Uh, Mr. Kiefer holds a doctorate of law and finished a postgraduate university program in general management with a focus on public, uh, public management. He's worked as head of the private office of Land Sal Salzburg's president and was director of the European Affairs, Ser uh, Affairs Service of Land Salzburg. He served as Secretary General of the Conference of Presidents of Regions with Legislative Powers, as Common Representative of the Austrian Lender for the Intergovernmental Conferences of the EU, and for the Subsidiarity Control Mechanism of the Austrian Lender. He is published widely and is a member of the Scientific Committee of the Institute for Studies on Federalism and Regionalism of the Iraq Bolzano Bozan. Mr. Kiefer was selected Secretary General of the Congress in 2010 and re elected in March 2015. And he's currently being appointed Acting General Secretary. So without further ado, please, Mr. Kiefer. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, greetings from the, the capital of Europe as the city of Strasbourg in France calls itself, being the seat of the European Parliament, but also being the seat of the Council of Europe, a pan-European uh, international organization established in 1949 by 12 states in order to defend democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And this is an issue that is 
uh, relevant at all times. Both, all of those three elements, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law need permanent work in order to be granted, in order to be defended, in order to be uh, developed. And this pandemic also showed that it is not only about human lives, about health, it's about the social tissue, about the functioning of institutions, the responsibility and the roles in these processes. It was very important to define the roles of the experts, the virologists, and the role of politicians to take the decisions, to take responsibility and to be accountable to the citizens. And it is very much about multi-level governance, about who does what the best and to find the right balance between efficiency and effectivity. It might be efficient to have a small group of people deciding what's going to happen, but will it be effective? Will people follow? And one of the elements, and that was also represented in some of the statements today is participation, inclusion, consultation, taking on board in order to uh, assure a very good quality of the decisions. And especially in these difficult situations, also to share the burden of the responsibility. Uh, the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities is the organization uh, representing about 150,000 municipalities, cities, and regions from 47 countries on the European continent, the Pan-European Conference of Mayors and Governors, if you want. Our Congress was established in 19, uh, was established in 1994, uh, so 26 years ago, in a period when Europe was completely about to change. 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall and many other democratic revolutions in the uh, countries of the former Soviet Union and its influence led member states to change their uh, democratic institutions. They wanted to rebuild a local self-government, which had a certain uh, connotation. Regional was always linked to former communist structures. And at that time, uh, the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities was established as the third political assembly of the Council of Europe, besides the Committee of Ministers and the Parliamentary Assembly, who are the most important institutions, and the Congress with its uh, five different uh, roles. I will uh, come to that. I will not so much speak about what uh, the Congress has found in uh, responses given by our members. We had very good and very thorough discussions of our three committees last week, where the monitoring committee discussed the impact of the crisis on uh, the functioning of democratic institutions. Uh, can elections be held? How legitimate is it to postpone elections and under which conditions and for how long? So all these issues are being discussed. The uh, Current Affairs Committee discussed the impact of the crisis on vulnerable groups, uh, especially in cities. It seems that the social tissue uh, in the countryside is more developed than in cities, also as a matter of, of capacity. And finally, the current affairs, uh, the governance committee, excuse me, discussed uh, the questions on how did the interaction between the different levels work. And there we found that both horizontally and vertically changes took place. Horizontally, sometimes central authorities tried to get back competences from the regions and the municipalities. And in many cases during the crisis, then returned those competences and gave even more responsibility to the local authorities as they saw that a one size fits all approach would not lead to the, res uh, to the uh, results that they wanted to. Horizontally impact uh, that we saw was that there was a shift in responsibility and action from assemblies, councils, parliaments to the executives, to mayors, to governments. So there are trends that we have identified and it's I think still too early to say how this will remain in the future or not. It's a period 
that we are still in where we have to watch, not to take uh, preliminary conclusions at this stage. We are in the middle of a process where also the institutions will have to uh, adapt. What we have seen and what was witnessed from our members, mayors, councillors, presidents of regional parliaments, regional ministers from our 47 countries was that wherever local and regional authorities were included in emergency task forces at national level from the very beginning, the quality of the decisions was better. The quality was more accepted at the local and regional level and was communicated in a uniform way. Also, and this is especially in the first phase, opposition parties were taken on board and they also carried this first lockdown, which was a very severe decision. Things are changing now. Oppositions are now with the knowledge of today criticizing what, uh, what governments are doing or have done. I think this is a phenomenon that you find uh, all over, but that does not mean that this dialogue in this extraordinary situation should not uh, continue. So a lot of uh, things happened at the national level between uh, the different national, local and regional authorities, but very much also happens at European level. The Council of Europe is not the European Union. The European Union with its competencies also in the areas of infrastructure and research, for example, but not health. And the Council of Europe with its values of, values of democracy, human rights, and uh, the rule of law. Very early, the Council of Europe issued a toolkit to defend democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in the times of crisis as a guideline for member states. And our Congress of Local and Regional Authorities has gathered experiences which we will put together and present to the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, uh, whose foreign ministers, if possible, will meet early November for a ministerial meeting in Athens under the Greek uh, chairmanship at this, at this stage. Uh, two more minutes. What are the tasks of the Congress of Local and Regional Authority? Well, it's a forum of exchange of peers, of mayors and presidents of regions, regional parliaments from 47 member states to discuss their needs domestically and vis-a-vis -vis international organization. It is an advisory and consultative organ for the Committee of Ministers and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, making proposals on the change of uh, Council of Europe conventions. There are more than 200. Uh, uh, on, on introducing new conventions uh, in order to, to, to meet the needs of the local and regional authorities. And very specifically, the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities is a monitoring body. It's the watchdog for local and regional democracy. Uh, 35 years ago, in, uh, the, the, the Council of Europe opened the European Charter of Local Self-Government for ratification. And now, as a, since 2013, all 47 member states have ratified this European Charter of Local Self-Government and the, National, the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities is the monitoring body. We also observe local and regional elections and give feedback to the member states what should be improved. So in order to establish an international body in, of local and regional authorities in an international organization, you, we should, you have to analyze what's the benefit for the member states and for the organization, for the Council of Europe, what's the benefit for the values this organization stands for, and what is the benefit for the local and regional authorities and especially their domestic umbrella organizations, their national associations of cities, national association of city of, of regions, uh, and so on. And there, we have a lot to contribute. We uh, offer a forum to learn from each other. And we know politicians want to learn, but they don't want to be taught. So this learning is an involvement that takes into account the philosophy of, uh, of politicians. It's the forum for innovation, to exchange good practices and not so good practices. And we don't come with a one size fits all approach. We are a hub for good practice uh, sometimes we have to be also realistic. Uh, best practice sometimes or very often doesn't work. Good practice is good. Good is good enough and solves many, many problems. And that is also 
in order not to discourage other countries that may not be as advanced as those ones who are, have a long, long, long uh, tradition. So uh, in, for, for the COVID crisis, better quality through consultation and early involvement and the international dimension, the role of a consultative and possibly monitoring organization within this international uh, organization composed of local and regional politicians sent by their respective national association can contribute to improving the quality of what is to be delivered by this international organization. That's for the in introduction. Thank you so much, Mr. Kiefer, and thank you to all of our panelists uh, for sharing their insights with us today. Um, I will now go ahead and open the floor for a discussion, and we have some questions from the audience, and I will also like to remind the audience watching uh, that we're still taking questions, so feel free to submit them as you see fit. Um, so the first question we have here, um, it says, in countries or regions where government financial support for people who have lost employment due to COVID has been adopted, was it a federal government responsibility policy or a subnational one? Do let me know if you'd like me to repeat the question. Can I ask? Can I answer? Um, sure, go ahead, Mr. Pierre. In, in the case of Uruguay, uh, this is the central government uh, that has the, the obligation to, to pay the, the unemployment insurance. insurance. Uh, because Uruguay, uh, it isn't a federal country, it's, it's, a, it's a unitary country. And in fact, the subnational governments are, are very weak. So the, the only thing that we can do with the subnational government is a kind of coordination uh, is, uh, in, some, in some works and in some tasks. But in fact, the healthcare, the, educa the, the educational uh, service, uh, services, the, the, the employment insurance, etc. Uh, belongs to the central government. Rem uh, remember that Uruguay, uh, m almost half the population uh, lives in its capital and uh, the metropolitan area uh, in, a, in a very small uh, space. And the rest of the country, the, the countryside, uh, has a very, very few population uh, per uh, Square kilometer. Thank you for that, Mr. Afia. We also have Professor Benke with a raised hand and Dr. St. John. So, uh, Professor Benke? Yes. Um, I think this is a very good question because we cannot talk about policies uh, and federalism if we do not talk about money. Uh, and so um, I can just contribute from the German experience. Um, and I am convinced that in part, in terms of, of, the, of the way we, we manage the crisis in terms of quality of life or economic development, um, indeed, we're, we were fortunate that we have a, a, a well-developed welfare state. And, um, and the money that was paid for the people was in part paid by the federal government and in part by the sub-state governments. We, there's there's a, a one instrument, I think this is really a German brand, in German, in German we call it Kurzarbeitergeld, which means money for people who reduce the weekly uh, workload. So um, the firms pay only say 30% of the salary uh, and the people work only 30% of the salary and um, the rest of the 70% is paid by, by the government or sometimes it's a bit less, it's maybe 50% or something like that. So this instrument was very useful in, in reducing the risk of unemployment um, in the wake of the, of the pandemic and it has been prolonged in Germany and this is something that is being paid by the federal government. But we also have um, kind of immediate relief 
uh, money that is being paid for um, people who, who, um, who work, um, who are not employed, but who work on their own devices. Uh, so they have small businesses or, or uh, small service uh, delivery uh, um, um, uh, jobs. And they got um, a small amount of money on a very informal way. And this money they received from the sub-national government. So uh, it, it, was, it was both, basically. Thank you, Professor Benke. We have Dr. St. John, then Dr. Almeida, and then uh, Dr. Bianchi. So we'll go ahead with Dr. St. John. Thank you. So in the Caribbean, the arrangement has not been legislated or consistent, and it has not necessarily been um, in the domain of the governments either. There has been private sector um, support to, to certain um, communities as well. But in the governments that have extended assistance, there has been a range and it's usually been at the um, national level. The Caribbean countries are very small. So it's usually been a, a range of assistance, including an ad hoc um, support uh, given out by uh, constituents. So it is more of a political process rather than a national um, social security safety net we have seen as well the suspension of IMF programs in order for governments to be able to afford to support citizens or even just simply to maintain persons in jobs. Because what they have done in the Caribbean is that they have tried to minimize job loss uh, rather than to allow jobs to be lost and then put on a, a support system. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. St. John. We'll, we'll go with Dr. Almeida and then Dr. Bianchi. Well, I mean, in, in the case of Mexico, we have never had like a strong unemployment benefit uh, program. Um, so uh, when, when the pandemic uh, hit the country, uh, the government didn't implement an aggressive uh, policy on, on that area. Um, the federal government um, implemented some programs uh, targeted to uh, support uh, especially small companies uh, with, um, with loans and uh, some loans were also uh, focused on the informal sector of the economy. And in a sense the, the subnational governments did more or less the same uh, and so uh, in, 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 in most cases, we, we had uh, programs uh, also at the subnational level um, focused on small companies and uh, aim to give them some, uh, I would say, temporary support, uh, especially in terms of uh, subsidies and, and loans. Uh, but I would say, but I, uh, no um, big um, initiative was uh, focused on uh, uh, unemployment. Thank you, Dr. Omer. And Dr. Bianchi. Yes, in the case of Argentina, most of the fiscal burden has been on the shoulders of the federal government. The, 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 the most expensive programs were the two that I, I mentioned before, the support for households, to 9 million people and for to pay the, the, the salaries of uh, almost half a million private companies. The, so that, that was mostly at the, at the federal government, but some has been in close negotiation with the local governments. For, for example, when most of the cases were concentrated in the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires and most of the provinces we're already in different stages and circulating. The government said, you don't need that support. And the, the different government said, yes, we do need this support for A, B, and C. So the, the subsidy continued. So it's been from the federal government with close negotiations with, with the government and the subnational. And another measure, for example, has been the, the setting up the, the subsidy for price controls 
of basic con consumption. But the overseeing of that price control was at the local, the very local uh, municipalities were in charge of, of that. And then the provincial and local governments were uh, implemented uh, less expensive uh, measures and programs like uh, uh, food, uh, food stamps and, and support of, of, of paying the rent for local uh, uh, business shops and th things like that. Thank you for that, Dr. Bianchi. Uh, do we have any more comments uh, regarding this question? I'm sorry, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, just, just to add to what everyone else has said, in Canada, we've actually seen all three levels of government play uh, according to their responsibilities and, and fiscal abilities. You've had the federal government, which has provided income support. Uh, you've had the provincial government, which has played in providing support to small businesses for, uh, for on, on uh, rent subsidies. And you've even had local governments play a very important role in doing things like deferring uh, property taxes. Uh, to me, the bigger question uh, in all of this is, uh, you know, what happens in the future? One of the things that the lockdowns did, I think, across the world uh, over the last six months has really devastated the fiscal uh, capacity and resource raising capacities of municipalities and, and provincial slash state uh, uh, governments. And so really the, 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 the only the only level of government that has the ability now to raise uh, raise finances are national governments or federal governments around the world, and uh, as we as we go into the next phase where local bodies or subnational entities become more important in the um, um, implementation of policies, whether it's screening, lockdowns, reconstruction, uh, I, I think what, what we have to think about is how the relationship between the various orders of governments are worked out uh, in order to find the most efficient way of delivering what essentially are going to be for a while uh, national or federal funds uh, to meet the needs of local communities. I'll shut up here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. If there are no further comments on this question, I'll go ahead and move to the next one. Um, another member of the audience is actually asking, due to the financial debts generated by the pandemic, not evenly distributed among fe federal and subnational governments, can we foresee institutional changes to be adopted to address this imbalance? If anybody wants me to repeat the question, I can go ahead or... Okay, I'll repeat it again. So due to the financial debts generated by the pandemic, not evenly distributed among federal and subnational governments, can we foresee institutional changes to be adopted to address this imbalance? Well, in, 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 the, in the case of Argentina again, uh, there's been a change in the in the quota for co-participation because of the the higher impact of the greater Buenos Aires area. So that was previously given to the city of Buenos Aires. Now is going back, and so this whole debate on the on the transfer and the and the thing on the on the fiscal transfer, the co-participation system we have in place. And the basic challenge is not through COVID, it's a long-term challenge. Our constitution from 1994 uh, ordered to make a new core participation law uh, seeking for the quality of development among different provinces, a specific setting um, indicators and ways to measure that. And that hasn't been uh, possible. So currently is now back in in the in the in the under discussion in, in the public arena on how we distribute resources and for what if they are air market if they are not oh, the COVID has brought up the needs of the and the infrastructure and resources on healthcare and security and education so and the the uneven development of the country is in the top of the agenda right now I hope this this uh, COVID help us 
to address these challenges and find a common solution. Thank you, Dr. Venki. Uh, Mr. Kiefer. Well, thank you very much. Uh, talking about our younger brother, the European Union, uh, there is something in Europe that you can expect. We have the so-called stability pact, the pact for growth, which limits uh, debtness to 3% of the GDP. And I'm sure, and this is valid for all member states. Some of them are more respectful than others already now, but that will be a completely new situation now. So there are mechanisms within most of the uh, member states of the European Union on how to share the burden, or on the other hand, on how to share the 3% among the federation, national government, regions, and local authorities. In Austria, for example, the country I've come from, the local authorities committed to underspend, meaning they contribute with a negative part of the 3%. So they, federal government can spend more on their behalf. The lender committed to equal budgets and so the federal government more or less can have the 3%. So there are domestic structures on how to negotiate about the share of the allowed indebtedness. And that will be a process that will go on all over Europe in all member states at the multi-level uh, uh, state wherever it's appropriate. As soon as the European Union has decided on how to handle this need of member states to borrow money and significant amounts of money. Thank you, Mr. Kiefer. We also have Professor Benke and Dr. Almeida. So, uh, Professor Benke? Yeah, I've been thinking on what Mr. Chetupadye was said uh, was saying. Um, I think this is a really complicated situation. Basically. Um, in federal systems, I think we can distinguish three types of, of how um, uh, federal finances are organized. Um, one possibility is that the subnational units receive grants, mostly conditional or sometimes unconditional grants from federal government. The second option is that um, we have separate taxes, so the subnational units have their own taxes, tax levying, tax bearing powers, and the federal government has its own taxes, or we have a system like we have it in Germany of, of joint taxes, of shared taxes. If I think of those three scenarios, um, I, would, I would expect that um, in a system where the subnational units mainly depend on, on, on federal grants, um, in the wake of the pandemic, there, there's uh, situation vis-a-vis -vis the federal government will be rather weak because um, they they have no negotiation power. Um, in the in the case uh, of separate taxes, um, it is a bit the same because um, the tax revenues will be considerably lower due to um, the economic crisis. And uh, I think that the strongest situation is for subnational units in a system of shared taxes because they're um, the, 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 um, the way taxes are distributed between levels of government is itself a matter of negotiation with the strong negotiation power of subnational units. So um, the question um, from, the, from the participants was, what, what is the expectation? How will the institutions change? And uh, I, I would wish that more, more systems would um, have um, subnational units uh, give them a say in how taxes are distributed so st to strengthen their power, but I would expect the opposite, that uh, the, the, um, <laughs> that, um, the, um, the, the vertical fiscal imbalance will, will get greater so that the federal government will get stronger in, in matters of fiscal distribution and uh, the subnational units will become ever more dependent on, on um, grants um, from the federal government. Thank you, Professor Benke. Uh, Dr. Almeida? Yes, uh, just to mention that uh, in the case of Mexico, before the, the, the COVID crisis, the federal government had been trying to address some of these uh, inequalities, but uh, mainly through 
big uh, federal projects, infrastructure projects, I mean, and, and social programs uh, target uh, particularly to the states in the south of the country that are the poorest. Uh, in the context of, of the crisis, however, and paradoxically, uh, the states that uh, put the, 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 the issue uh, in the agenda, demanding a revision uh, of the fiscal pact, uh, had been the states, uh, the, the richer states, uh, the states in the north, uh, arguing that uh, most of the GDP uh, is generated in, in those uh, states and they don't receive enough money uh, in terms of uh, federal transfers. Um, but I mean, in this case, I, I think it's not um, just a technical discussion, but it's mo mostly a political discussion because most of these states are governed by uh, governors and role in the in the opposition. So uh, I think um, in the case of Mexico nowadays, it's difficult to uh, separate uh, technical discussions from uh, political uh, or, or for for for. Uh, separating them from, from the general context of political uh, polarization uh, experienced by, by the country. Thank you, Dr. Omeda. Uh, sure. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Rupak. I, I want to agree with uh, uh, Dr. Olomeda that I think uh, the issue of institutional structures post-COVID is essentially a political one. Um, you know, I think on, on the one hand, um, I, I also agree with Professor Banker that we would like to see in many places a uh, trend towards centralization in terms of decision making uh, um, or imposition of uh, rules and regulations from the top. Uh, and, and, but, but I think also in many countries, and I speak again of Canada, uh, where I'm from, uh, we do see, so Canada, Canada is slightly unique uh, amongst many, many federal or decentralized countries in that our subnational governments were actually very solvent. They raised most of their own source revenue. Uh, but, also, but, but because of uh, what, has, what has transpired, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, subnational governments are now uh, not, not as solvent as they used to be and will require much greater backstopping from, from the federal or national government. Um, and, and so, of course, this gives the high level government's disproportionate power. But I think there's also amongst policymakers a, a realization that if you really want to be effective in, in managing the aftermath, of, well, first in managing the, cri the, the COVID crisis itself in terms of, um, you know, keep putting a lid on infections and spread and all of that, you need uh, to rely more on lower, lower order decision making uh, to have a differentiated, nuanced response uh, to local situations. Uh, but also that it, going forward in the future, even the rebuild uh, uh, will, will require a lot of inputs from the local level. Uh, and, and so I, I think the interesting uh, clash will come in, clash, uh, I'm exaggerating, but, but, but disagreements will be uh, between uh, the, the impulse of perhaps the higher order governments to centralize decision making and the lower, lower orders to uh, to try and come to bespoke uh, solutions, uh, yeah, and and this is essentially again, uh, I agree, this is a political question. How it's going to play out, you know, we we don't know, uh, but but I think there is there is recognition everywhere, uh, at least from my my readings of what's going on in different parts of the world, that there is a recognition in the policy community within within the political community that uh, that that local solutions are needed. I mean, in, in this in this sense, I think um, uh, Germany, I, I'm, I, I, I would say I'm a bit jealous of the German system, uh, where at the end of the day, the federal government has very little capacity to actually administer solutions and therefore institutionally is forced to rely on uh, on the land and, and, and lower order governments in order to actually uh, actually things um, to, to make things happen. And I think this is a very good uh, institutional uh, approach, but of course I recognize the complexities, the constitutional and institutional complexities of other countries in trying to get to that kind of, a, of an outcome. Thank you. Thank you so, uh, so much, Mr. Chattopaya. Um Magdalena, please. I, I just want to echo what Rubak said, and I think that it's very important um, 
uh, and I, I would like to stress that is why we believe that it's um, paramount to raise the voice of the subnational governments in the hemispheric dialogue to get a better understanding of the realities at the local level. And especially because if we don't, what the consequences will be um, as we, as we you know, begin this new, very difficult stage of, um, in a post-pandemic scenario. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any any more comments regarding this question? Okay, so moving on to uh, moving on to the next uh, question submitted by the audience. Somebody is asking, uh, how can communication between central and subnational governments be streamlined to ensure more fluid exchanges and communications? Uh, sure, Mr. Kiefer. Well, uh, behind me, you see Article 4.6 of the European Charter of Local Self-Government, which is all about consultation. The con Congress of Local and Regional Authorities has established a guidelines and a handbook for and a consultation strategy. So it must be regular, substantial, timely. There are many aspects, transparent also things that are being taken into account should be published as well as those who are not and the reasons it should be institutionalized and not based on, per on persons. So yes, there are ideas on the table, good practice. And I invite you to consult our Congress website on the consultation strategy. Thank you so much, Mr. Kiefer. Uh, do we have any more comments on this question? No, okay. Uh, we'll move to uh, the next one and okay, somebody here is also asking, I am interested in hearing perspectives on the constitutionality of restricting travel across subnational borders, particularly when it is the initiative of subnational governments themselves. Yeah. Well, yeah, just, can I go? Yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Well, I mean, in, in the case of Mexico, um, some national governments uh, didn't uh, implement, uh, restri I mean, uh, strict restri restrictions to, to enter the, their territories. Uh, but in some cases, uh, for example, some states demanded that, um, flights uh, were canceled, uh, that, that's a, an attribution uh, responsibility of the federal government. And so uh, the federal government did, didn't comply with, with that demand. Um, so uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, of course it's, it's not uh, permitted in, in the constitution and we didn't face uh, particular situations where conflict arise uh, in, in relation to, to that, uh, to that issue uh, as uh, was the case in, in other uh, countries in the region. Yeah, yeah sure, Mr. Kiefer. Thank you. Well, just to contribute from, again, my home country, Austria, where parts of the European phenomenon was sparked up again after the Italian uh, colleagues suffered most at the beginning. Uh, one region, uh, Land Tirol, locked down the whole region and you were only allowed to leave your municipality for compelling reasons, going to work or going to a pharmacy if there is no pharmacy in your own. The regional government of Land Salzburg, for example, uh, closed down five municipalities where the figures were extremely high. So there was the will to take responsibility at the local or in this case regional level and it contributed to the acceptance. Maybe also because the hospitals in Austria are run by the regions and so they have the direct responsibility for both sides, the health system and the health infrastructure. So yes, there are examples where a complete ban and police was really controlling whether people were allowed to leave their municipality and that's at a very, very small scale. Thank you, Mr. Kiefer. Anybody else for that question? Sure, Mr. Chetafaya. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the whole issue of constitutionality of in, intranational, trans, uh, cross, pro, cross provincial, cross state movements uh, yeah, has been called into question. There have been challenges in many parts of the world. Uh, but I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, just uh, having done a just having a survey of various countries where they, they've they've imposed um, um, uh, restrictions of movement across state or provincial boundaries, most most of most of these states or most of these subnational jurisdictions have actually relied on uh, on, um, on on declaring health emergencies and they and excluding it that way. But this still remains of. Uh, uh, a sore issue in many, many countries. So, yeah, it's still something that's being worked out in courts and amongst constitutional lawyers. Thank you for that. Um, but any further comments on this on this question? No? Okay, so we'll go ahead with the next one. Um, this is our last question. Uh, somebody from the audience is asking, what are the main challenges that have been identified in coordinating an effective response to the crisis, best practices and lessons learned? Uh, Professor Benke? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I didn't mention this before, but um, uh, federalism typically interacts with party politics. And uh, in Germany, we, we witnessed this, this tension, so to say, um, that um, from, the, from the point of view of, of the interests as a subnational unit, there was a, a, a strong spirit of coordination and of cooperation. So people really talked to each other and they negotiated. Uh, joint solutions, and then every uh, every subset unit would go on to to issue its own executive orders. But they were really re very similar, and and many instances they were issued the very same day. For example, in terms of lockdown of schools and universities, it was the same day from the northern to the southern part of Germany. So this worked pretty well. But as I said, uh, we also have party politics. So the heads of government and the individual sub-state units have their own interests in terms of running for uh, uh, campaigns. Uh, and and we, could, we could very well observe that um, typically those heads of government who had ambitions as, as, as running for, in, for example, for the next term of, of German chancellor, they really stepped out of this coordinated line and tried to gain profile by doing things on their own. So there's always a challenge if you have a, a federal system with relatively high autonomy of sub-state units, uh, how to contain those, those, um, those interactions between a kind of federal competition and a kind of party political competition. Thank you, Professor Benke. Uh, do we have any further comments? Well, I'm afraid we're at the end of our discussion. I would like to thank all of our panelists for such a rich discussion, as well as thanking the members yeah, of the audience. I see you had a comment. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think that the, the challenge is to coordinate not only inside the country, between national, central and federal governments and subnational governments. Uh, the challenge is to coordinate the global response against the, 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 the virus, uh, especially to, to coordinate uh, when the vaccine appears and when the vaccine uh, proves a uh, good result. Uh, because uh, if you have some uh, herd immunity, but your your neighbor uh, that that doesn't that doesn't has it. Uh, it will be impossible to to improve the the glo the global situation. Or uh, well, at least the region a regional situation in our country, for example. Uh, here the, there isn't uh, social circulation of the virus. Almost uh, the social circulation is almost uh, uh, nil, but we have a problem uh, with our border 
With Argentine, we don't have uh, a big problem because we have a, a, a river and we keep the, the bridge close to importation. Uh, we only only uh, transportation with certain uh, with certain re restrictions uh, will enter into Uruguay. But on the north, the border with Brazil, uh, it's a uh, it, 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 uh, it is impossible to to keep it uh, close because uh, we have streets to to cross from one country to the other and. Uh, the, the last uh, outbreaks, the last three or four outbreaks came from Brazil. So, uh, until Brazil uh, can uh, uh, have a solution, Uruguay will not uh, have a, uh, has a solution for, for, the, for this uh, phenomenon. So, I think that the, the coordination and the, and the lessons uh, needs to be coordinated at a more global, uh, um, more global room for to, to say to say uh, to say something. Uh, in, in terms of uh, this, this is very very important. Especially, I I say again when the vaccine appear because. Uh, if the, of course, the vaccine will uh, will be made uh, in the central uh, countries, in central in Europe and US, but in this part of the of, of the world, we need some some uh, amount, some some amount of, 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 of vaccines to to immune our population, and we need it at the same time. This this is this is a. Uh, this, uh, this is the problem for us, because in fact, uh, we right now we try to to enter into a lot of mechanisms to provide the vaccine, but we are sure that uh, we will uh, on the tail of the of the fight <laughs> of the line. We tail of the on the tail of the line to. To, to have it. Thank you, Mr. Alfie. Um, anybody, anybody else would like to add anything? Okay. Uh, again, thank you so much to all of our panelists and to the members of the audience for submitting the questions. And Liam, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, and thank you, panelists, for uh, a very rich uh, and insightful discussion. And uh, thanks, of course, to all of you uh watching the stream for contributing your questions absolutely great got some good discussion going um i only wish we had time to answer more but unfortunately uh, time is against us now um <clears throat> we've covered a lot of ground i think in the discussion today and this highlights the complexity uh, both of the covid crisis and some of the challenges that you know rebuilding better uh, could pose um, and so now uh, to conclude our event, I'm very pleased to now invite the OAS Secretary for Strengthening Democracy, uh, Mr. Francisco Guerrero, to provide some comments to conclude the event. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Secretary. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I, I would like to thank the organizers of this event, our expert panelists for their excellent presentation, as well as our very efficient moderator, who confidently guided the discussion and seemingly liked, linked one session and a speaker to the other. I would also like to take the opportunity to reiterate the importance of the new partnership that has been forged between our Department of the Promotion of Peace, the Forum of Federations, and of course, the University of Kent. The critical discussions that have been taking place today represent just the beginning of a series of highly relevant programs and activities that we will be hosting jointly in the future within the framework of this new alliance. I have been invited to offer some concluding remarks for our webinar this morning. So I would like to begin by highlighting the most important takeaways from this event, which is that while, while the role of subnational governments has become increasingly relevant within the context of the pandemic, it has become, as we have seen, indispensable. While the member states of the Organization of American States, 
vary widely in the land extent and population, there is no doubt that the authorities and the subnational matter a level, no matter the size of the country, carry the weight and responsibility of addressing the needs of the local communities. Today, we have been reminded how their effectiveness depends on a number of factors, including counting on sufficient resources, coordinating closely with other levels of government, as well as with the private sector and other non-governmental institutions. And finally, governing with transparency and accountability. It is for those reasons that their voices can no longer be ignored or sidelined. Within the OAS, we have taken an initial step in this direction, as Magdalena Talamas mentioned, by creating a section within the newly created Department of the Promotion of Peace to focus exclusively on this issue. We hope to take a further step by identifying a space with the organization to enable ongoing exchanges between representatives of subnational governments of the hemisphere and the governing bodies of the organization of American states. It couldn't be clear from the representation by our expert panelists from Argentina, Mexico, and the Caribbean that each corner of our region is facing historical challenges in almost every sector of society as a result of the pandemic. Notwithstanding the differentiated impact of the COVID crisis among countries, regions, and municipalities, local authorities are the most appropriate to offer and implement viable solutions to overcome these challenges. It is not coincidence that we have organized this webinar on the symbolic date of the International Day of Peace. All of the efforts that we have advanced from the OIS Secretariat are directed at improving the lives of our fellow citizens, citizens in every aspect of the lively lives, in other words, at promoting peace in its universal definition. We cannot have peace when hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children have died because of a lack of access to appropriate health services. We cannot have peace when more than 150 million children have been left out of the classroom as a result of the pandemic. We cannot have peace when we are at the brink of an unprecedented humanitarian crisis as a result of food shortages. And I can go on, but in sum, we cannot have peace until we rebuild more just, equal, tolerant, and inclusive societies. And we can only effectively make progress in this endeavor by acting, engaging, empowering, and lending a louder voice to those who are closest to the communities they serve, the representatives at, at the local levels. Likewise, although we have listened with much trepidation about the setbacks that the COVID crisis has induced throughout the hemisphere, we have also been present with the good practice examples of Uruguay and Germany, which illustrate how the ability to quickly and effectively coordinate the response at, of uh, all levels of government can make a difference between life and death. The experiences and knowledge shared by the experts who joined us here today include concrete actions and measures that can be taken to tackle head on the challenges posed by the pandemic. There is much to be learned from these values lessons and we are very grateful for this contribution. In the same manner, the representative of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe presented a highly successful collaborative example of a mechanism that facilitates collaboration between national governments and regional and local authorities in a progressive, interconnected and interdependent world in which the OIS is cognizant of the need to increase the participation of subnational governments in the hemispheric dialogue to chart a new era of collaboration with these influential local actors and is committed to learning from the experiences of other regions in order to achieve that goal. Yes, the pandemic has been devastating, but at the same time, it's, it presents a unique opportunity to refocus our priorities and redirect our resources towards rebuilding more just and peaceful societies. If we are to succeed in this complicated task, 
we must walk in hand with those that represent the most direct point of contact between government and citizens and who best show uh, the knowledge and understanding of their communities. I'm talking about the local authorities. Thank you very much for having this wonderful seminary. My congratulations to Magdalena Talamas, uh, who has been working very hard with his team in order to achieve this seminar. And a, spe and a special thanks to the University of Kent at Canterbury. I started my master's degree and my PhD back there. So it's always a nostalgic moment to remember my, my passing through this institution. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for those reflections. Um, and with that, uh, our webinar has reached its conclusion. Uh, thanks to all of you watching the stream around the world for joining us. Uh, we would like to extend a, a big thank you, of course, to all our panelists and speakers um, this morning for their fantastic contributions and insights and for generously giving us so much of their time in their very busy schedules to be with us. Uh, and of course, we're also very grateful to our moderator, Anna. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, a few uh, thank yous and acknowledgements to make before we uh, leave you today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, all of the colleagues and partners involved in organizing this webinar. Uh, in particular, special thanks go to my forum colleague, Diana Shevanova, for her crucial work in convening this event. Thanks also to John Light of the forum uh, for ensuring we were able to broadcast this to you uh, today to the world. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Ricardo Cabral, Adriana Gutierrez, and Rogelio Cantoral uh, at the OAS for their contributions and support for helping to make this happen, as well as all of our colleagues at the University of Kent, including Teresa Backman and Rob Chapman. Finally, um, a big thank you to Magdalena, Neo, and Rupak for their commitment to our collaboration, uh, which has made this event possible. Certainly, the Forum and the University of Kent are looking forward to supporting the OAS further in its work in the future. Uh, so thank you for watching and wherever, I, wherever, ah, wherever you are in the world, excuse me, have a great day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much.